Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again Richard Mayberry. Richard uh, is the publisher of U.S. and World Early Warning Report for Investors, and he's written a whole lot of other books, uh, all of which I recommend you take a peek at or buy them, look at them, study them, actually, uh, because he provides a tremendous amount of wisdom. Um, you know, we really need to understand history to understand better why things are the way they are now and why people feel the way they do uh, about each other. And Richard does a remarkable job in his work in helping us understand that. And uh, I would suggest that you go to richardjmayberry.com, richardjmayberry.com, uh, to, um, to learn more about Richard and his background. We also have a, uh, his biography is posted at the Voice America Business Channel, my page at that channel. So you can go there to, uh, to read his bio as well. Thanks for joining me again, Richard. Always a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you. I always uh, like being here. Uh, you uh, do a great job on this. Uh, I, I really enjoy your show because you do your homework before the show. And so you really know the subjects, and uh, and I appreciate that very much. Well, I you know I have people on for a purpose because they're saying things that are very important to me. Uh, and today we'd like to talk to you about uh, the content, some of the content in your last newsletter, uh, specifically Turkey, Turkey and the Oil Corridor. You said in that issue, you said, and I quote, the most important wars being fought now are in the oil corridor. Can you define the geographical limits of the oil corridor and help our listeners understand why wars in this area of the world are so important at this time in our history? Yeah, um, that's the oil corridor is the area that contains well over half of all the world's oil supply and um, uh, oil reserves and the oil that's in the ground. And that area runs from about the top of the Caspian Sea, which uh, is in uh, Western Russia, um, down to the um, Arabian Sea, and then um, in the east uh, into Iran, and then uh, in the west all to the Mediterranean. You know, I call that the oil corridor, and um, it is alleged to have, I should say, um, most of the world's oil in that one small area. And that's where so many wars are fought. Uh, it's, it's just uh, not only full of oil, but it's full of chaos. And uh, I've always recommended that the U.S. government get out of there, uh, that we couldn't, uh, couldn't have anything but our own uh, involvement in the wars if the U.S. government remained... Uh, in that area, and you know, of course, they they didn't listen to me, <laughs> and uh, that's why we're in all these wars now. Yeah. Well, I wonder if there's not some other reasons as well, Richard. You know, um, after Nixon took us off, or yeah, after Nixon took us off the gold standard, Kissinger went to Saudi Arabia and established the petrodollar, in which the petrodollar then provided a bid under the dollar that wouldn't have been there otherwise. And a lot of people think that part of the reason that we're in the Middle East. Uh, is in order to perpetuate or to protect uh, that uh, dominance of the of the oil markets. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Certainly, I want to. We want to get into Turkey and how that might fit into it. But do you think that may be one of the reasons that we're there? Yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure it's one of the reasons. There's never just one reason for sure. the war. Uh, you know, every politician who's involved in a decision making process about going to war has his own personal agendas whatever he thinks is important. And, um, you know, all of these agendas come together in that meeting room and, and then they all uh, converge on the idea of where, you know, this war is going to do me some good for whatever reason and, and then they declare the war or at least get into it. They don't yeah. really declare them anymore. They just get into them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unconstitutionally, but they do it nonetheless. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but it, it, it's very helpful, I think, to, to always keep in mind that each politician has his own personal agenda, his or her own personal agenda, and when enough of those agendas come together and point at war, that's when you get a war. Yeah, indeed, and thank you for that, because that's an insight that I had never thought about before. It, it, sort, of puts, uh, it sort of puts aside the notion of conspiracy or conspiracy 
uh, by one or two people. It's got to be a group of people, as you mentioned. And, and um, mm-hmm. it, it seems to be sort of running out of control a lot of times. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, except it does to those people that are in control. Well, uh, speaking of that oil corridor, smack dab in the middle of this corridor is Turkey. And that's a country that has been about as pro-West as any Muslim country, I suppose. I, I think you would agree with that, right? Probably? Yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's... Uh for a long, long time, it was the only Muslim member of NATO. Uh, it was joined by Albania in 2009. So there's only two Muslim countries in NATO, and, and Turkey's really the big one. Um, they are also um, the military giant of that area, too. And that's a very important point to keep in mind. They are militarily dominant in that area. Because they're part of NATO, they have access to all of NATO's intelligence and weapons, not all the weapons, but most of them, and um, the training and all of that. And and so the Turks uh, have this military tradition that comes out of the Ottoman Empire, and by hook, being hooked up to NATO, they are the dominant military force in that area. Yeah, and uh, of course, 99% or something like that of the, of the people that live in Turkey are are Muslim, and so there is a natural conflict uh, ideologically, uh, religiously, uh, philosophically about how governments are supposed to be run or how sh- how they should be run between the West uh, and uh, and the Isla- uh, Islamic uh, folks. Uh, so it seems as though there's there's quite a conflict going on within Turkey itself over West or not. Right? Is, is am I right about that? That's right. Yeah. Um, back uh, in World War One. Uh, a man named Kamal Ataturk was uh, the hero of World War One to the Turks. He beat the British and the other allies at that time and pretty much threw the you know, Western powers out of Turkey. But the Western powers were able to dismantle Turkey, Turkey's Ottoman Empire. And so uh, Ataturk believed that the reason that the Turks lost their empire was that Turkey was too backward. It was looking eastward toward the, the Islamic world rather than westward to the Christian world. And he said that the Turks should start adopting Western ways. And the U.S. government, and this is a really important point, very key point, the U.S. government adopted Ataturk's model for handling the Islamic world. The Ataturk said we need a mixture of Islam and democracy and, uh, and the Western technology that goes with it. Um, the problem is that, that there's this fundamental difference between the Islamic world and the Western world that is not reconcilable. And mm-hmm. that is that the West believes that the way you find out what's right and wrong is through majority vote. That's called democracy. And the way Muslims believe you find right and wrong is in the Quran. They believe right and wrong is determined by God. The West believes it's determined by majority vote. And that's a contradiction that is not reconcilable. And that's why Turkey is always internally in this, this uh, conflict. There are, there are millions in Turkey who want to go West. There are millions who want to go East. And they are always on the brink of civil war because of this. And by Washington adopting Kamal Ataturk's belief that the two could be married, um, Washington is over there in the Mideast trying to democratize millions and millions of people who are never going to believe in it. They are never going to be democratic because they believe right and wrong comes from God. Now... (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it is a hopeless situation for the U.S. to be in. Right. It's an agenda that, that Washington cannot possibly achieve. And I've been you know, harping on this for I don't know how many years, that there's nothing Washington can do in the Mideast except make things worse. Well, as you point out in your letter, there's, the Muslims have a, have a point. They have a reason to be skeptical about democracy. Um, maybe you'd just comment on that. What, are, what do they see about democracy? Aside from the Koran, they certainly um, you know, believe that you know, that's what they need to live by. That's their religion. They believe that they need to live by that. I would suggest that some Christians also believe uh, that we should live according to, the, to God's will as well. But, that's a, but clearly, 
uh, there's uh, Christians seem to be quite mixed up on that as well because they've uh, they've adopted democracy. But but you know you you made some points about why Muslims are aside from the Quran they can look and see what's going on in the West and it's not all so good. Yeah, uh, for a long time, and you know, it was easy for for Ataturk, for instance, to sell this idea that democracy is a superior. Um, way to do things because the West was so much more technologically advanced. It was advancing economically much more quickly than the Islamic world. And so there was some credibility to it. Well, now, of course, um, the Muslims can look at the Western world, uh, for instance, the, the economic catastrophe that is Europe, and they can see that uh, this idea of majority rule <laughs> doesn't work out too well in the long run. Um, majority rule or democracy, um, they might say, is two wolves and a sheep voting to decide what's for lunch. <laughs> That's what I was yeah. looking for, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, and they can see that now. They can see where that goes. And <sighs> most, I think an awful lot of Americans and Europeans can see that now, too. Yeah. That... that uh, this idea that we're going to vote on uh, who to steal from and, and who to subsidize, um, that's not a good way to run an economy. And now it's falling apart all over the place. So the credibility of the Western model that the, the Muslims were offered is evaporating away very quickly now as the West gets more deeply into its economic problems, its welfare state. Yeah. Well, we're we're trying to we're trying to convince 1.6 billion Muslims. Uh, we can't do it logically, so we're doing it with our bombs and our bullets, I guess, uh, to to convert to Christianity and I, I or to the West anyway, if not Christianity. And uh, you know, obviously, as you say, it's a, it's a no win situation. Well, I have to ask you know, you, you, in your letter, you seem to be suggesting that American policy uh, is moving more. Closely, if I understood you right, we're moving more closely in line or trying to align ourselves more closely, perhaps, with Turkey at this point in time. And I, I had, had to think and wonder if this might not have something to do with the fact that uh, Turkey has agreed uh, with Russia to have a pipeline built and constructed that would go through Turkey and that would deliver gas, I think, to Western Europe. Do you think... Do you think that's a concern of, of the United States and, and NATO? And um, and might that also have something to do, um, you know, might our desi- a desire to move closer to Turkey be have something to do with Russia's uh, moves into Assyria right now? Yeah, um, uh, yeah definitely uh, the U.S. politicians are worried about uh, the, you know, about Moscow moving south. Um, and uh, there's Turkey right in the way of, of Russia. A good point is that the Turks and the Russians have been fighting with each other for many centuries. It's an ancient hatred, and um, there's there's no reconciling that either, because because essentially that goes back to the old religious wars. This mm-hmm. is, is you know the Russia has a Christian heritage, uh, Turkey has a Muslim heritage, so they are ancient enemies. And um, the fact that Turkey is part of NATO means that Russia is pushing up against NATO down there where Turkey is. And the U.S. politicians are all concerned about that. And I think, though, a larger concern here is that the U.S. politicians, I think, now I can't, I don't have any hard evidence on this, but I'm pretty convinced that um, they have come to the conclusion that the Mideast is going to be run by somebody they don't like. And that somebody, it's going to be run by somebody who hates Washington. Because it's getting so that everybody hates Washington. Sure. For good reason. Uh, yeah, right. Now, these poli- U.S. politicians have their noses stuck in the business of, of practically every country in the world. And in every country in the world, people are getting very angry. So... They've, I think they have reconciled themselves to the fact that the Mideast will be run by somebody who hates Washington. And their only choice in the matter, if they have any at all, is to try to find somebody who doesn't hate Washington too much. Yeah. Um, and I think they have decided they can live with the Turks. The Turks, um, you know, don't have a lot of good to say about Washington, but they don't hate Washington anywhere near as much as, let's say, Islamic State does. Mm-hmm. So I have a suspicion there is a secret 
plan in Washington to try to ease Turkey into these wars and have the Turks uh, eventually take over the Mideast and reestablish the Ottoman Empire in that area. Uh, and, and actually, I hate to admit this, but I think it's probably a, a fairly workable plan. It could be pulled off. Uh, among other things, the people who live in the Mideast aren't real happy with their own governments. And they're, they're sick to death of the wars and the other kinds of chaos. There. Mm -hmm. And I, I really suspect that if there was a realistic chance of the Turks taking over the Mideast, um, that millions and millions of Muslims would jump at that. They would consider that to be a better system than what they've got now. So um, it makes a lot of sense to me, not that I think that it's a 100% chance it would, it would work, but I think it's, you know, putting Turkey, re reviving the Ottoman Empire, putting Turkey back in charge of the Mideast is the most realistic plan that Washington could come up with the most workable plan within their their assumption that they are entitled to run the world, mm -hmm. and they would see the Turks as one of, of their puppets. Right. Very interesting. Well, then, when you speak of the Ottoman Empire, empire, then does that pretty much encompass the the oil corridor that you're talking about? Yes. Yes. Um, there, there was a day uh, when the Turks were so influential. They, the Turkish culture controlled so much of the world that you could travel all the way from roughly Italy to the Pacific speaking only Turkic. Mm -hmm. That wow. much of, of the world, um, and from, from northern Kazakhstan all the way to the Indian Ocean. Um, so when was that, this, Richard? What time in history was, this, was that true? Um, well, that's a really important point. It's still true. Yeah. Okay. Those cultures are <laughs> those cultures are still Turkic. Uh huh. And this wide swath all the way from Italy to the Pacific. Uh, mm -hmm. They're they're still Turkic in in all those countries, not all those countries, but a lot of those countries across there. So the Turks at first when the Soviet Empire fell apart back twenty five years ago, the Turks were thinking in terms of reviving the Ottoman Empire because these Turkic cultures already existed, and it would have been probably pretty easy to do, uh, especially since Turkic, Turkic rule would appear much more comfortable to them than, the, for instance, the Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Turks wanted to, to go west. They wanted to hook up with Europe and, and join in with the Western culture, and so they really dropped that plan. But I kind of suspect that maybe that plan is being revived now. And mm -hmm. um, you, you really, if you compare Turkey's political situation, bad as it is, with the political situations of that whole area in, in Asia there, the Turks don't look so bad. <laughs> right. And I think, I think tens of millions of people over there would warm up to the idea of being part of a new Ottoman Empire. Right. Very interesting. Well, I, I, at the same time, though, uh, again, okay, so maybe they could have their Ottoman Empire reestablished, but uh, with ultimate rule being NATO. That's probably the way Washington wants it to go. Right. Uh, I, I, I think very quickly the Turks would decide they don't need Washington anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, that's interesting because he, here's what I want to get to yet before we've, we, you know, before we run out of time because that's always what happens with you. Uh, you know, you talked about some very important things. There was some attacks, I think, on the 20th of July that mm -hmm. took place in Turkey. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Where did they come from? Any idea of what, what's going on with that? Nobody knows. Um, there, I never saw any evidence on it. There, there were some accusations that it was uh, Islamic State who did it. Um, and the Turks, the Turkish government, just jumped right at it and um, started bombing uh, Islamic State. So they, they, they were attacked by somebody in July, and they got into the war. Um, now, I have to look at that and wonder who had something to gain from that. Um, maybe it was a false flag incident that was cooked up by the Turkish regime. Maybe it was cooked up by Washington. 
we'll probably never know. But uh, it looks like the Turks are moving into the war now against the Islamic State. And, and this could be the beginning of Washington's plan to help the Turks take over the Middle East. Because mm -hmm. somebody's eventually going to end up running the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is who? And my guess is Washington's choice is Turkey. Well, that's interesting because you, you mentioned then um, the Turks started bombing after that event. And, and on the 24th, Turkey's president made a, a statement. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, about a, a, a change in direction or something like that? Yeah. Um, I don't remember his exact words, but, yeah. but basically what he said is that we are changing course and we are getting into the war now. Um, they've been resisting that up until the summer. And uh, suddenly they got attacked and they turned right around and now they're getting into the war. Um, yeah. So that, you know, I began writing about this possibility of the Turks taking over the Middle East long ago, at least 10 years ago. And um, it kind of looks like we're headed in that direction now. They've started looking away from Europe, and they're looking to reestablish the empire. Yeah, and if they bombed the Islamic states, that would make that would make sense—a pro-West uh, move, it would seem. But here's the yep. direct words, and I'm looking at your newsletter now, Richard, uh, mm -hmm. which I have in front of me. On on July 24th, Turkey's president announced that quote. We have now undertaken a much different battle, and we will do whatever it takes in this fight until the end, end of quote. And then you mentioned on that same day, Secretary of State John Kerry said U.S. officials are now seeing a, quote, shift in what the Turks are prepared to do, end of quote. Right. Washington had been trying to push the Turks into getting into this war for years, um, the, you know, for reasons we already talked about, Turkey's yeah. part of NATO and, and all that. Um, and suddenly, bingo, you know, the Turks get attacked, and now the Turks are in the war. It's exactly what Washington's been wanting, and now they've got it. So, well, you know, yeah, I, and, you know, we can ask ourselves, now, are the Turkish politicians really stupid enough that they're being steered by Washington? Or have they decided to sign on to this plan? And I, I have a suspicion that they've signed on. Yeah. And the big big prize for them is the oil field. Yeah, very interesting. Well, you know, I just have to wonder now, with just a, a couple of minutes left here, Richard, the United States, with its reserve currency, has been able to expand this empire. You know, it has the military... Uh, a military capability second to none. Now, you mentioned, of course, in the in Asia, uh, we've left, we've slipped somewhat there. Perhaps if we want to dominate the Chinese, we're going to have to, you know, bolster things. I see the Japanese are being uh, a big fight in in Japan over uh, over the notion of allowing Japan to rearm itself and uh, and and protect probably members of the transportation the TP. TPP, uh, the, the Japanese are opposed to actually being involved uh, in uh, in going to war, even when they're not attacked. If other members of the TPP are attacked, I guess, and so there's a big fight going on there. But so, but in terms of world domination, you, I just have to wonder. It seems to me the whole notion of being able to have the world's reserve currency is absolutely imperative and and we're watching as you mentioned the the muslims looking around at the west and seeing it decay from inside out the financial structure is absolutely in in you know in chaos and and ready i think to topple over how long can this thing go on i'm wondering financially how long can we afford to do this and and isn't this the downfall of empires many times is they they, they crumble from within yeah uh yeah they do um there's there's as far as i know there's always an economic component to the collapse of any empire. Um, it just, it's just too expensive. The, the reason that empires fall apart is they're not profitable. Uh, it's, it causes the home government to be hemorrhaging money all the time. And, and that's what's going on. Um, I, uh, I, I remember a statistic, and this is a long time ago, but um, at that time, Washington was spending $60 billion a year just to keep the Saudis and the other Arab oil dictators in power uh, in the Persian Gulf. Yeah. Um, that, and, and so Washington was spending a lot more to keep them in power mm -hmm. than... Um, than they were getting out of it. Oil. Yeah, yeah, they could have just bought the oil 
a whole lot cheaper than keeping their armed forces over there. You, you know what an aircraft yeah. carrier costs? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. incredible. Well, this yeah. is the key question, and unfortunately, we're, we're out of time, Richard. Again, it's just always, it goes so fast with you. Uh, I just want to tell my listeners, uh, richardmayberry.com, go there. Learn more about his excellent newsletter, Early Warning Report. This is one I can't put down. I always read it as soon as it gets to me. And you just can't go wrong. Very reasonably priced service. Richard, thank you very much for being with us again. And I look forward to to doing it again, hopefully next month. And uh, we can talk about some of the key issues in your next month's newsletter. Yep. Sure, definitely, and thank you, Jay. You do a great job. Thank well, you. I really love your work, and it's so important that people understand what's really going on and why it's going on uh, to make an informed decision. We didn't talk economics today, but you also provide some great advice in terms of how to prepare for the difficulties ahead that stem from these geopolitical issues and these financial uh, problems that we have. So thank you very much, yeah. Richard. And again, folks, check out Richard Mayberry and sign up for his newsletter. It's very important. 